Hello, Ms. Dancheva. So we are here and we are absolutely honored and uh, it's our pleasure to have you with us. So please kindly go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues and excellencies. It's really great to be joining you today a, a bit, as you said, a bit early. Uh, I'm currently based in London, the UK. Uh, and uh, very happy uh, to be sharing the global uh, experiences and perspectives uh, on behalf of the company that I represent. Um, so as you kindly introduce my name, uh, I will uh, just briefly remind everyone of who I am. So my name is indeed Tamara Dancheva, and I sit as uh, Senior International Relations Manager for the GSMA. Now, uh, what is the GSMA? Uh, the GSMA is the uh, global trade association which represents the mobile industry. So we have over 700 mobile network operators as members um, of the association and more than 500 members uh, in our extended uh, mobile ecosystem. Um, so we are truly a powerhouse uh, because we represent the global mobile industry. Um, so the mobile network operators uh, in South Korea are members of GSMA, just to put uh, what we do a little bit into perspective. Um, so of course, we also look into the importance of uh, mobile connectivity for good. Uh, we uh, signed the UN Women Empowerment Principles uh, in uh, 2019. Um, so let me share first a little bit about our journey why did we sign the UN Women Empowerment Principles? Why are they important for the GSMA and our leadership? And what has happened since then? Because of course we are now uh, in, almost four years later since that uh, key moment for, for GSMA. And in the middle of uh, all of this, as you may know or recall, sadly, we also had the global COVID pandemic, uh, which of course has also impacted, um, you know, the experience of a lot of companies around the world, including the GSMA. Now, uh, our director general, uh, Mats Grandit, uh, Grandit, is a huge feminist. Um, perhaps some of you have met him. I know the colleagues from UN Women certainly have. Um, and so, of course, um, that mattered uh, when it came to us signing the UN Women Empowerment Principles, because that decision was led from the very top and by Mr. Grandit. Uh, he also led uh, the mobile industry to become the first sector to commit to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals back in 2016. Uh, so, of course, uh, commitment to the UN SDGs, uh, therefore, forms a core part of our values, a core part of our global commitments, and a core part of our work. And I hope you all agree with me that unless and until we fulfill SDG 5, which is on gender equality. None of the other SDGs can be fulfilled either. And so, of course, driven by that vision, that commitment, and that understanding, Mr. Granrit, uh, of course, led uh, the mobile industry in GSMA also to sign the UN Women Empowerment Principles three years later in 2019. Now, uh, we as GSMA have long been uh, as spoken uh, on the importance of uh, gender equality and women's empowerment, uh, both in the workplace um, and, of course, also in our operations and also through the, mobile, uh, through the power of mobile um, technology, uh, on which I will elaborate in the second uh, bit of my presentation. But going back, of course, to the issues pertaining to the uh, UN Women Empowerment Principles, and that is, of course, how do we achieve gender parity at the workplace? And more importantly, how do we ensure that women are not just uh, you know, there uh, to fulfill a quota, but they're actually implemented uh, as part of the decision-making uh, mechanism um, of any company? Uh, of course, for us, it was therefore important that when we signed the principles, we were able to substantiate this commitment with action precisely because of that because we didn't want this to just remain a signature on a piece of paper, uh, fulfilling uh, you know, a, a, a commitment just, just for the sake of, uh, for sake of it, right? And so uh, I have to say that since then, um, this has really driven our whole strategy uh, around um, gender inclusive work culture and workforce. Uh, 
Uh, of course, at the GSMA, we look at the issue more broadly. What do I mean by that? Uh, you know very well that it's not just about including women in the workforce, but it's also about looking into intersectional issues, right? So how do we, how do you include women with disabilities, which is very different with, you know, uh, from, from just, uh, of course, um, ensuring that uh, you include uh, women on uh, around the table in the first instance, right? So how are you creating a workspace that um, is able to facilitate uh, the participation of women who have uh, a right different different needs uh, than than the rest. Uh, of course, uh, the same goes uh, for women from different ethnic uh, backgrounds. Right? What are what are the considerations there, uh, 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 and so forth and so forth. So we look at the uh, in the GSMA we look at these issues as well, and of course we also talk about diversity and inclusion more broadly, right? Uh, because of course we recognize that uh, uh, we need to achieve gender parity, but it's also so with that, how do you make sure that you include also other, uh, uh, you know, vulnerable groups or underrepresented uh, minority groups in the equation? Um, so uh, what happened uh, since 2019? Let me give you a few examples. Uh, so we created uh, an employee-led forum called One GSMA, which represents the voices of of us, of, of me and uh, my colleagues, right, who, the people who work uh, for the GSMA and who make up the DNA of the GSMA. Because um, if I can give an advice or encourage all of you to consider is how do you change your, 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 your company culture, right? Because it starts there. I mean, yes, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, having that leadership from the top is absolutely critical, right? Because you need the leadership buying. But then, you know, you need to ensure that you have the employees buy-in and that becomes a part of your company culture. Because of course, you cannot enforce it from the top if you don't get that buy-in. So we created this employee-led forum precisely with that idea in mind, is to make sure we give voices to the employees, uh, firstly representation, and secondly, we wanted to hear from them in terms of, you know, how do we ensure gender diversity um, among, um, you know, top leadership roles um, at the GSMA? You know, what else can the leadership team do um, in, in this regard? Because, of course, they need, they, you know, they need to ensure there is this constant feedback from, from the employees. How can we nominate gender champions among us? to speak about these issues with their colleagues um, in their departments, right? Bring visibility. Uh, you heard earlier uh, about the importance of educating uh, fellow colleagues, but that education, again, shouldn't just come from the top because otherwise it will be perceived as being enforced, um, we also heard about some uh, some questions around. Well, how do you you know mitigate discontent from uh, you know groups that are let's say well represented, which is typically the male population of any company, right? So that is why employee buying is critical. That's why we created one GSMA. Now the key to this uh, employee-led forum is that it's sponsored by the leadership. What do I mean by that? One GSMA at the moment um, has three sponsors. They're all from the GSMA leadership team. So our uh, chief financial officer, who is a female, uh, Louise Estherbrook, she is one of the co-sponsors. John Justy, our chief regulatory officer, and Lizzie Chilton, who is head of human resources and, of course, oversees our diversity and inclusion work. And that sponsorship is critical because, again, it indicates, of course, the willingness of the leadership to support these conversations, and it allows for that two-way um, feedback I spoke about, right? Um, and that has been incredibly successful. Uh, as part of One GSMA, we organize regular talks and webinars for um, the company, for the employees, for the leadership around um, some of the issues we are discussing today. Uh, we, are, uh, we have appointed, as I mentioned, gender champions in each team, um, to talk about these issues, because sometimes it's also about the language you use, right? How are you describing the role of women in, 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 your, in your space? You know, are you using the right terms? Are you also differentiating between gender equity and gender uh, equality, right? Um, you know, how do you speak about women who have different needs in, you know, in a mindful way, in a respectful way? Uh, because of that and because of the best practices we saw from other UN Web signatory companies, we created a language guide and um, do not worry, I'll share links to all of these best practices after my presentation. 
that language guide contains precisely that. Uh, uh, you know, terminologies, explaining those terminologies, why are they important and how should employees use them to discuss these issues among themselves. And it helps, of course, uh, when we also speak about these issues externally, like I am today on behalf of the GSMA. Uh, so that all happened after we signed up to the uh, UN Women Empowerment Principles. Um, and last but not least, we also implemented uh, two uh, instruments to monitor, track and report on progress. One is um, our action plan, which we adopted in 2020. And that action plan details uh, our goals towards diversity and inclusion, including around gender-driven diversity. Uh, it included uh, aspirations around gender parity on our board. Um, it also included specific targets around including uh, or making sure that we become more inclusive from an ethnic uh, uh, and disability point of view. Um, and of course, it also provided uh, clear um, objectives tied to our commitments with um, UN Web's signatories. So there are five goals and the action plan then details how is the GSMA going to achieve these goals. And that action plan is public. It, it's, of course, for us, but it's publicly available on our website, also because we want to share this experience with other companies. And lastly, we produce a diversity and inclusivity report, which again, we make public. Uh, and I'm happy to share that this year is the second edition. Uh, actually, the report was just published uh, last week. Uh, and in that report, we actually uh, um, report on uh, issues such as the gender pay gap, uh, part of it, of course, is also based on um, as per um, legislative requirements. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with UK legislation, the UK does mandate that companies of the size of the GSMA are to report or, on their gender pay gap. Um, so we also started reporting on ethnicity pay gap and disability, uh, and we are looking into reporting on disability pay gap. Uh, it also details um, the GSMA's um, representation in terms of, uh, you know, uh, male, female uh, on, on top leadership roles, but also senior manager roles, uh, as well as, of course, global um, company population and other, uh, uh, of course, important factors. Now, we are a global company, um, so some of the data we collect uh, uh, pertains only to operations in the UK where we are headquartered uh, or the US uh, because of course we need to comply with US legislation and to a certain extent with the rest of the world but again it depends of course on, on the relevant uh, legislation in the countries because we have representation in uh, India, Kenya, uh, UAE, um, I mentioned of course the US, the UK uh, and uh, Brussels. So, of course, we also need to take into account, uh, you know, what data are we allowed to collect uh, and what data is, of course, uh, not allowed. And then, of course, what data can be collected on a voluntary basis. Um, I know I have probably already uh, ran over my time. Um, I, I don't know, of course, if, if that's the case, but I'm cautious. I've been speaking for a while now, so maybe I will um, quickly uh, continue to my next uh, point of the presentation. And then, of course, I will be happy to take uh, questions uh, pertaining um, to um, GSMA's experiences as um, uh, UN Women Empowerment Principles signatory. Uh, now, to quickly go, of course, um, through uh, the rest of the questions, um, and I'm glad, of course, we are also discussing uh, them because, uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning, we need to look into how are you also um, you know, representing your internal commitments around gender um, in inclusivity uh, and gender-based inclusivity and diversity externally, right? Um, and so um, I was asked to, to give you a, a brief remark in terms of, you know, why is it important we support women, right, in tech? Uh, we support women in the workforce. Uh, and how, uh, you know, how is this, of course, translated in GSMA's external commitments? And we also saw that this year, uh, the UN Commission on the Status of Women uh, discussed and looked into the issues relating to technology and innovation and education for women in the digital um, age for the first time ever, right? Um, so therefore, you know, why does that matter? Um, I mean, I hope you agree with me that digital technologies are, are critical for today's um, society, right? I mean, uh, you, these days you can barely do anything without using a digital tool. I mean, let's just look at the mobile phone because I represent the mobile industry. You do everything on your mobile phone, right? You do your banking, you do your education, you communicate, um, and, you know, it goes with you everywhere. So it's an incredibly empowering tool. 
Therefore, of course, when we look at digital technologies more broadly, we can't afford to leave women and girls behind. But unfortunately, there are often, more often than not, the one unconnected. And this is also substantiated by data GSMA releases around the mobile gender gap, which this year we released. Uh, so every year we release data around the mobile gender gap. And this year on International Women's Day, we released our preliminary data for 2023. And the news is not good. So women are still 19% less likely than men to access the mobile internet, all right, uh, in low and middle income countries. So huge gap, uh, which uh, has been exasperated due to the consequences of the global pandemic. There are also 17% less likely than men to own a smartphone. Again, uh, just looking in, in, in the context that where GSMA collects this data from, and this is low and middle income countries. Um, we don't have data particularly on South Korea, but I'm sure that uh, you agree. When you look into rural areas in, in South Korea, you can still see the divide, particularly, of course, among women and girls, right? So uh, we need to keep, keep that in mind. We also know that 90% of future jobs will require digital skills. Um, so therefore it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's really critical women and girls are included because otherwise they will be excluded, not just from the digital space, but from the, the global economy uh, as a whole, right? Um, and then we know that of course, empowering women with digital technologies also empowers them um, and brings them independence, brings them much needed financial independence. Um, and therefore, of course, um, uh, hopefully also encourages them to, to continue to pursue studies in, in, um, in the tech sector. I mean, sadly, less than 20% um, of tech jobs are currently held by women, right? And that's critical because we've also seen that that leads to gender bias in emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence. Why? Because you don't have enough women who develop these solutions and therefore, you know, they're uh, biased from the get-go and they, rather than tackle the gender bias in our societies, they, of course, uh, um, uh, re, uh, uh, enforce it. To change that, to shift that, we also need women at the top. We need women to be software developers, um, engineers, and of course, also uh, deploy um, this uh, uh, technology in, uh, in, in the field. Um, so we need to think about the fact that it's not just about bridging the gap in access, it's about bridging the gap in skills, bridging the gap in leadership, and lastly, research, right? Because if we don't know what the issues are, we can um, solve them. So I want us to reflect on this. I'm very happy that um, the UN Commission on the Status of Women for the first time ever recognize that we cannot achieve gender equality until and unless digital gender equality is achieved uh, in the first instance. Um, so we saw, of course, uh, that was also reaffirmed in the conclusions uh, that were adopted by member states. And I'm sure um, the colleagues from UN Women can share that report if it's of interest. Um, so as GSMA, we are active advocates in the space. I spoke uh, around our work on the mobile gender gap. We are also working in the international uh, arena with key stakeholders. We are one of the five uh, co-founders of the Equals Global Partnership for Gender Equality in the Digital Age, alongside UN Women, proudly, as, as well as um, the International Trade Center, the International Telecommunications Union, uh, and UN University. And that global partnerships, partnership aims to bring the public and private sectors to bridge the digital gender divide. And through Equals, we are dedicated to a plethora of projects around uh, bridging the gap in digital skills and leadership, which I won't have time to talk about um, today, but uh, feel free to uh, ask me, of course, subsequently in, in the questions. Um, and of course, we contribute to important uh, policy discussions around these issues in the global uh, sphere. We are active in the Women 20 Forum, which is the Women, uh, which is an engagement group of G20 dedicated to advise G20 governments on women empowerment and gender equality issues. And of course, we work closely with, with our colleagues at the ITU on policy related recommendations and a number of other international organizations. So I'll stop here uh, because again, cautious of time uh, and welcome any questions. Thank you so much. And, and absolutely thrilled to be with you uh, here today. And I am speaking uh, to you from Singapore. So uh, the time zone for me is uh, much more palatable than I think uh, for, for Tamara. Um, so today I wanted to share with you um, some of the initiatives um, and commitments that we've made at MasterCard. Um, we've been on a very strong journey um, with regards to our gender balance and representation within MasterCard. 
Um, firstly, I, I want to start by um, sharing with you that uh, we anchor everything very heavily in our diversity, equity and inclusion strategy, of which gender balance is a very key initiative. And at MasterCard, and I think Tamara um, mentioned it earlier, company culture is incredibly important. Um, and for us at MasterCard, we are guided uh, by our commitment to decency. And our culture of decency uh, permeates everything, everything that we do. And when we look at diversity, equity um, and inclusion, we have a very clear policy statement. And this really helps anchor our organization um, in its commitment from the CEO through uh, every level of, of the organization. And we have a very, very clear stance, which we are very public. It's uh, widely publicized and we're very proud of our uh, commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, where we do ensure that we respect the uh, rights of all people and we have no tolerance for hate, discrimination or any other form of hostility towards others. And we work and strive very hard for an inclusive environment and we want to ensure that everyone is welcome, regardless of their beliefs, uh, their cultures, their backgrounds uh, or their abilities. Um, and because of our very strong commitment to decency, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We embed all of this through our company's DNA, uh, which we call the MasterCard way. Could I take us to the next slide, please? So this is the, the frame for our DEI. Um, and I just wanted to, to call out the two key areas of focus for us with our DEI strategy, which is around, um, firstly, inclusion, education, and awareness. And secondly, we strive to ensure that all employees can reach their greatest opportunity. And underpinning this, we have a very strong business resource group, um, which we are present in 130 chapters. We have presence in 47 locations worldwide. And these are resource groups that are uh, formed to promote a very inclusive culture within our organization. And each of our chapters believes heavily in fairness and equity. And they represent the diverse communities of our employees um, and our allies. If I can go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. So um, across our DEI strategy at MasterCard, I talked about the MasterCard way initially and that we also have our two key areas of focus. Um, I'd like to spend some more time very specifically talking about our gender balance initiative, which you will find at the bottom of the pyramid. So our gender initiative, as you can see, fits very much into our broader DEI strategy in MasterCard and is part of our commitment to DEI. But what is different about the gender balance initiative is that it has a single-minded focus on women because for us, women everywhere still face inequality and, and exclusion. If we can go to the next slide, please. So in uh, 2022, we actually launched a refreshed gender balance initiative. And this is an, uh, an initiative that um, is applicable both internally for our employees, but also externally for our customers. And we had a very clear mission, and our mission is around designing a better world for all women that creates li uh, limitless possibilities for everyone. And we also have a very clear ambition, and our ambition is to be the employer, the brand, and partner of choice for women. And our work is organized into three key pillars, people, where we have a very specific focus on advancing women in our workplace at MasterCard. Secondly, the market, and that is the markets where we operate for our customers. And we want to be the brand of choice for women. And thirdly, our commitment to society. And for us, that is around our partnerships that promote gender balance uh, for society. And we made this commitment because we believe that at MasterCard, we're really committed to leading the change. We want to reshape the world that is designed, which is sometimes designed without women in mind. And often the design of the world has been done uh, without women involved. So for us, through our innovation, 
through our technology. Um, we want to open up the possibilities for all women, for everyone and everywhere. Um, uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to spend some more time very specifically talking about our people pillar, because this is all around the, way, the work that we are doing internally and have been very um, effective at MasterCard in advancing women in the workplace. So we've aligned our people pillar and our strategy around three key areas. Firstly, grow. For us, grow is the development of women in the workplace. Um, and I've just got some sort of key examples of some of the most effective solutions that we've had within our organization that have really helped us with our gender balance. Um, well, we're very proud of the progress that we've made with our gender balance. So we have, a, we have leadership programs very specifically calling one out, um, which is called what we call Women Who Lead. And it is quite a unique program. Um, I had the uh, privilege of going through the program a couple of years ago, and it, um, it's very much around women's leadership, but amplifying the voice of women in an organization. And it's one of the more unique women's leadership programs that I've experienced in my, in my time. Um, and quite frequently, we, we often find that women do struggle with having um, not just a seat at the table, but a voice around the table. And in our region, in, in AP, working for a global company, that means that our voice in the organization might typically be in an evening on a night call or um, in, a, in an English speaking environment, and you know that can be more challenging for us. So uh, we had a very targeted program to address these development areas for women, and we found it to be very, very effective. And um, we also have a commitment for um, preparing our female leaders for board positions, and that also ties into our thirty percent club mm -hmm. uh, membership. So we also have a program where we prepare our female leaders, and we give them the opportunity to practice leadership behaviors which are required to progress into senior leader position seats on boards. And we provide the uh, training through real life simulations, and we are providing experience for our vice president level and above, uh, women and uh, people of color. And we do um, aim to have them board ready for seats perhaps in the next sort of two to three years. And we also want to you know, um, use this program to enhance their skills so that uh, they will have the right capability and experience to be in uh, positions of influence. And thirdly, we are members of uh, the 30% Club. And this is where we uh, have a commitment and a mission to have at least 30% of women on boards and C-suites. And we also have our leaders in our organization committing um, to be part of a mentoring program for 30%. 30% uh, club. So that again is part of our aspiration um, and our commitment and we, we look to hear that through our um, boards of impact. Um, very importantly, retaining women um, is, uh, is a key focus for, for us as well. Um, and one area that I particularly like to call out that we're very, um, very proud of at MasterCard is our gender pay equity. At MasterCard, every woman earns $1 and at the same at the equivalent level for every male in MasterCard. So we have worked very hard to have pay equity within our organization. Um, for us to have done this, we have set up a framework. So we examine pay practices annually and we do this with a third party. Um, also, we ensure that all the roles in our organization are reviewed and benchmarked appropriately. And we assess compensation and we look out for potential pay parities by gender or any other categories. And if we do find disparities, we take action. And we do this on an annual basis and ensure that we are correcting those actions when necessary. And finally, um, we also have additional channels. So if there are employees who want to raise pay disparity concerns or they have issues and they want to have a channel to have a confidential discussion. We also do offer employees the communication channel to raise these concerns. They can raise it through our ethics helpline. We also have a um, employee relations team that operates globally, or they may raise their issues to our, our law department. 
So we really take a very holistic approach. And annually, um, through our assessment and validation process, uh, we have continued to see that globally, women at our company earn $1 to every $1 earned by every man. Uh, the turn from the top, I think Tamara mentioned earlier before, um, that is absolutely critical. Um, and as, as part of our commitment um, from 2021, we actually tied our executive compensation to our three ESG goals. And one of those goals was uh, gender pay parity. And actually um, in 2022, we've actually tied that to all our employees' executive compensation. So all employees' compensation. So we have a, um, we have a, a very strong commitment that is resonating through the, the whole organization when it comes to, to pay parity. And I think that is a really important and effective um, way that we have ensured gender balance within our organization. We also have very, very um, market leading gender neutral people policies. Um, as we know, women may take a step out of the workforce and historically may have earned less because they may step out of the workforce to have children. And so we have um, ensured that we, all new parents uh, have eligibility and access to our parental leave policies so that men and women equally, so women will have access to these parental leave policies for um, taking parental leave. And we offer a minimum of 16 paid weeks for females globally. And we also offer minimum of 16 weeks paid leave for our male employees who are taking parental leave because they may be supporting a spouse in the workplace. So we have also enhanced our bonus eligibility during this period. So um, you know, we feel that that's a very leading edge and that is applicable globally. Um, and you know, we have seen a really strong take up and um, some you know, extremely strong feedback uh, from our new parents who've been able to take advantage of this, um, of this policy. Um, and we also have a number of uh, gender neutral working, you know, flexible working. Uh, we have a work from elsewhere policy that again, applicable to all. And we do support health and well-being of our, our women and our men um, through a number of different platforms. We have a Thrive Global platform. We also have um, employee resource groups. And um, we all, our family building benefits policy, this is another um, area that's been quite sort of leading edge. We provide financial assistance to uh, globally for adoption, surrogacy, and fertility. So again, we're, we're really um, supporting the whole uh, person to, to, to come to work. And very importantly, uh, we have attract. So our attract um, hiring practice is really important. We in, we have candidate slates, so diverse candidate slates for all our hiring for roles at Mastercard. And so that really does ensure that we will have a female on every slate for an interview process because that is, and we've, we've really found that that has made a significant difference in moving the needle with our gender representation. So uh, globally, 81% of our slates had at least one female candidate for all roles. And 41% of our global hires have been women. And we are in the payments and technology space as well. So uh, for us, that's a, a really, really um, incredible achievement. Um, and then I, I know that we're running short of time. So I will also just mention one other, uh, which is our returnship program. So something very specific has been a, a supportive program that we've designed for experienced mid-year, uh, mid-career professionals who may have taken a career break. So this is providing extra on-the-job support and coaching for women who have taken a break and are looking to return to the workplace. And again, having that additional element of support is really um, providing that pathway back into a professional work environment. And again, which we are finding is uh, proving to be very effective in helping uh, develop and support the progression of women in our workplace. And um, most importantly, it's all data led. So in terms of measurement and reporting, uh, we are a data organization as well. And so underpinning all of our initiatives, we are very clear on our goal setting. We are very clear on quarterly dashboards and metrics, and we do track and measure the progress of every single one of our initiatives. Some of these are internal, and we also do external benchmarking 
Um, and we also ensure that everything that we produce is scalable and it is very globally uh, minded. Uh, we are present in, in AP, we are present in um, 18 countries. And so we do ensure that everything that we do is applicable across all of the countries where we operate. And just the final slide is just some of our recognition. Um, for us to ensure that we are making progress, it's all very well to benchmark ourselves internally, but it's also really important for us to benchmark externally. So if I just take us quickly to the final slide, um, we do participate very actively in external awards and recognition to ensure that the actions that we are taking and the progress that we are taking is at least as good as um, or better than all our peers and organizations. I think we're all aiming for the same thing. And so for us, the external recognition and the, and the measurement um, is, really, um, is really important. So hopefully I've provided a few areas that um, and some initiatives and actions that we've taken um, within MasterCard. But uh, yeah, I know we have some Q&A at the end. Um, so happy to, to take any questions um, that you may have at the end. Thank you. So good afternoon and good morning. Uh, firstly, I'm very, very pleased to be here to share our own journey in gender equality, specifically uh, in our supply chain and, and marketplace. And many thanks once again for the webs uh, for this invitation. Uh, my name is Nilifar Demirko, and I am the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Nestle since December 2019. Uh, currently, I'm based in Nestle's headquarters in Switzerland. In my role, I drive the diversity and inclusion agenda through Nestle's clear ambition and strong internal and external commitments, which is very key to drive the agenda in the right way. So in the next slides, you will see some uh, numbers about Nestle. Nestle is the world's largest and most diversified food and beverage company, providing safe quality and nutrition over more than 155 years. 275,000 employees and selling in 188 countries and has more than 2,000 brands worldwide. You can see with these all these numbers, we are uh, diverse by design. So uh, in, the, in the next slide, um, I would like to also mention uh, why we signed the webs. I mean, this is very important to understand that the values that we stand for is always also in line with what we do. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is an integral part of our company's culture, and it's one of the ways we bring our purpose and values to life. And we embrace diversity by being more inclusive, creating a workplace that provides equal opportunities for everyone, and that treats people with dignity and respect. And respect is our values, uh, which we said respect to ourselves, respect to our others, respect for the diversity and respect for the future. We have three impact areas, as you see on the slides as well. And it's the first, the culture. It means that the way we work, how we leverage the diversity and inclusion of our employees. It's so important, but we know that our impact is goes beyond our culture. It's the society, the way we act, meaning that how do we act and engage the society and the stakeholders wherever we operate. And the third one is, I mentioned about the number of brands around the world, it's more than 2000. How do we develop products, services for the diverse needs of our consumers and customers? It's the innovation, the way we think. So uh, in the next slide, I will talk about the priorities because we focus our inclusion efforts on four key pillars of diversity and gender balance remains a key component of our approach, which also involves the recognizing that gender equality in our, in particular, women's rights and empowerment are critical to create shared value for our business and for society. And in the next slide, you will see that to advance the gender equality and empower women, in the workplace and marketplace and the community to show our commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment and to contribute to a more just and equitable world. In 2013, 
as a headquarter, we signed up the United Nations Women's Empowerment Principles. If you go to the next slides, you will see that, I mean, we started with the, uh, with the uh, headquarters, but we didn't stop there. Globally, uh, we, we show our commitment, but we also want our countries, our markets to sign the same. And we are working, uh, having now more than 20 of our countries sign the VEPs. So why it is important to be a web signatory? If you look at all the seven principles which we have, we have mentioned uh, in the beginning of uh, the presentation, these principles are there all in line with our approach to the woman empowerment as a company. It's simply the right thing to be a signatory as well as seeing that there is an important business case that all businesses benefit from the greater equality for women and these principles are the true foundation of this cause. So as a company, our goal is to ensure women feel supported, valued and respected. And we have been working to balance the gender makeup of our workforce and create a gender balanced leadership in the company, as well as UN Web support us to advance the gender equality in the marketplace and in our supply chain, which I will be also giving some examples as well. So being a web signatory, I think it's a concrete way for companies like us to show our commitment to gender equality and gender uh, and women's empowerment. Can we go to the next slide, please? So after uh, being the signatory, uh, we, were, we were able to gain the access. I mean, first of all, the value that we had being a signatory is so important that it also gives us also do more meaning that we were able to gain the access to the global network of the companies who are like-minded and the resources which also helped us to connect and learn from each other. Uh, we benchmark our practices and exchange to leverage each other's experience. And it has also an uh, impact on enhancing our own reputation among our employees, customers, consumers, investors, and other stakeholders as a socially responsible organization. So it definitely has an impact on our employer branding and we are uh, more likely to attract employees and also retention of our talents whom we want to keep them to drive successful business results who also bring innovation and growth. So we have more, much more engaged and motivated employees who perform and willing to go beyond which brings higher productivity and uh, great results. Another value add, uh, and it was mentioned before, is it's very linked to our commitment to meet our sustainable development goals, because the principles are aligned with the SDG, which aims to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. So it's it's right thing to do, definitely. So if we look at um, the, the supply chain part, the marketing practices, uh, we, we, we can say that we are proud of the progress we have made to empower women, particularly within our workforce. However, uh, we know that there is more to be done, very far from uh, to be great, but particularly within our supply chains and our marketplace. Uh, and stressing the importance of remaining in education, supporting women's incomes, and running tailored agricultural training programs are part of our efforts to help women, their families, and wider communities. Just a quick uh, example, thousands of women in Pakistan have been trained in our dairy supply chain since 2015, and we are committed to furthering the prospects of the women as key agents of change towards a generative, regenerative food system. Uh, in the next slide, you will see a, a, a brand, most of, uh, of you maybe know, uh, is a great example of Nespresso. If you go to the next slide, please. And Nespresso uh, recently signed the web, uh, proud to say, as a business. Uh, so it's also important to show the commitment uh, with their own supply chain. Uh, and uh, for decades, Nespresso has been promoting gender equality all through their value chain, uh, through specific gender programs of our Nespresso 3A sustainability quality program. What does 3A means? It's a program 
uh, as uh, it's, it's a coffee sourcing program designed to ensure the continued supply of high quality coffee while improving the livelihoods of the farmers and their communities and protecting the environment. So with this program, they have worked with the partners to address the underlying causes of the inequality in the coffee farming, ensuring that the empowerment is present from coffee bean to the cup and beyond. So it's so important uh, to, to have these uh, actions in place in the, in the farming areas as well to make sure that we are uh, uh, improving the livelihoods. And uh, building this recent example, in 2015, Nespresso's AAA Sustainability Quality Program developed a global gender equality strategy to change the program from within. And if I mentioned about the gender analysis too, I can tell you it is a very eye-opening analysis for us. It's the first milestone in this journey was introduction of this gender analysis tool designed to provide the insights to enable action to be taken so that women are given access to the resources they need and are empowered to be part of the decision-making process. It's a rigorous data collection in depth of the gender analysis uh, and the survey instrument adjusted to suit the cultural context as well. We know that one size does not fit and we have different cultural contexts. The survey was also uh, adjusted for that and uh, we adjusted also for the gender norms and the local coffee production specifics. We started with the pilots. It always uh, gives the uh, insights from the pilots in three different coffee producing regions in Indonesia, in Guatemala and in Ethiopia. And now the gender analysis tool is now uh, widely recognized as an example of best practice. It's currently used by many gender practitioners and in the agricultural cult sector as well, and uh, has been cited in numerous publications. But if you would like to know more about what we're doing in Nespresso's work on the gender equality today, and what benefits empowerment can bring to the coffee growing communities, you can really, I mean, go to Nespresso's gender equality coffee web website. So, you can all start with the analysis in your own supply chain and you should be able to examine the factors such as access to education, training, finance, as well as gender-based discrimination and harassment. So this is one example. There are other great projects, gender projects, uh, like financial planning and decision-making for women uh, with the low literacy and numeracy, increasing the woman's decision-making power, uh, and control over the income at a household and the farm level. Uh, we do also women's leadership workshops to build confidence, public speaking skills, and knowledge of the supply chain. Uh, we even go to the trainings of family nutrition, kitchen garden trainings to ease the woman's household burden and help to reduce the poverty and malnutrition. Uh, and try to uh, create that safe spaces on the learning activities to explore and share gender dynamics. These are some uh, few examples that I would like to share uh, with you from on our supply chain. And happy to take your uh, questions at the end of the uh, session. I know that's a uh, very little bit time restricted, so I stop here and uh, let my colleagues to continue as well. Thank you, Arjang, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be invited to speak at this event today. As you heard, I am Candice eaton Gall, Global Diversity and Inclusion Leader for RSM. RSM is the sixth largest network of independent audit and accounting um, and consulting firms worldwide, and we have representation in 120 countries. I'd like to start with sharing where the WEPS journey started for us. Um, I think it may resonate with many of you in the audience today, and maybe it will help you to think about some points um, as you navigate through the consideration phase. And possibly some of what I say will assist you in preparing for the resistance to change uh, that you may be challenged with, which from the question that went to Miwa, um, I, I think that you may be struggling with. 
The structure of RSM is that it's a network environment. We have a common global brand and global services, but each of the member firms operates as its own separate entity. When I took this role in September 2020, I identified that WEPS is a framework that our local CEOs and managing partners in all of our member firms could commit to because it could be made suitable to their size and meet their needs in their specific geographic locations, um, as well as providing for consistent calculations and areas for reporting, which is so important um, for me for uh, in terms of global oversight. I think the biggest value in commitment that we have found is for our employees, um, which in is critical in a, uh, a scarce skills talent market that I think we are all finding ourselves in. Um, I'm pleased to say that as of last week, we have 12 RSM member firms who have committed to WEPS, which affects about 30,000 RSM employees. Now, I know that that sounds like a big number, so I would like to reassure people who are here from smaller organizations. One of those firms has only 26 people in it, and some have a few hundred people, and two of those businesses have a few thousand people. My point is that the framework is fit for purpose for all sizes of organizations, and knowing that you don't have to have everything perfectly in place at the time of signature, because this is a commitment towards progress. It's a commitment to be in a better future state, and that makes taking that first step a little bit easier. The commitment made by the CEO or the managing partner in our case gives a clear message that progress towards gender equality is a priority. It opens the opportunity for top leadership to invite feedback from employees um, and to deal with what we call in Africa, the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, the big gray thing that everyone can see, but pretends not to because it's too uncomfortable to deal with uh, and you could get squashed. Um, a bit of, of maybe lighthearted humor there, but what we have seen is dealing with this issue and opening these conversations results in people feeling heard and valued, which we know has a positive effect on employee engagement, job satisfaction, and of course, retention. There is a sense of humility that is appreciated by employees that comes as a result of this commitment because it allows for that openness and that honesty. The second part I'd like to address is about transparency and accountability. You may have been able to tell from my accent uh, and maybe from my elephant proverb as well, that I am South African. And so I have lived through how important transparency and accountability is for equality generally, not just for gender equality. It takes time and commitment to address historic imbalances. Without transparency and accountability, there is just not enough pressure to do things differently and drive results that are going to lead to meaningful change. Corporates have a position of great power when it comes to social justice issues, and gender equality is an issue that almost every industry in the world um, is facing. WEPS is designed to be a vehicle that addresses that sustainability development goal five, and doing the right thing for gender equality is a moral imperative, but of course, as our other panelists have also highlighted, it helps that there is a business case for the benefits that gender diversity brings to business, to employees, and to our communities. Good corporate governance means taking charge of public perception, or perhaps in some cases, public scrutiny. And as a result of hyper-transparency um, of social media and our increasing interconnectedness, we need to be honest about the position of our businesses in terms of the current state, regardless of whether that position is favorable or not. 
And especially if it's not favorable, to be honest about it and open about it, because it takes humility and it garners the respect um, of the marketplace and employees. Because, of course, it's courageous to admit that there is a journey for improvement and that, that there is a commitment to action. Um, my, my third point is that in many countries, such as South Korea, reporting is not mandatory. And I expect that many of you in the audience today are challenged by this. My thoughts on that challenge are this. Successful organizations are not those who take gender equality as a regulatory compliance function. They are organizations that can see equality is critical to attraction and retention of top talent, as our other panelists have spoken about. And of course, because of that, it's critical to remain competitive in an increasingly global marketplace where there is a huge focus at the moment on sustainability and on social justice. Businesses that are wanting to be sustainable and successful have gender equality as a focus at board level as critical governance issue. And this is really for three reasons. As part of identifying their framework on ethical leadership and sustainability, in terms of the opportunity greater diversity in all forms brings to business. And of course, from a business risk and reputational risk perspective as well. The World Economic Forum Gender uh, Pay Gap Report for 2020 and 2021 showed us that progress towards gender equality went backwards, indicating that that progress was not substantial enough to hold up in hard times. This data and other research has led to increasing research, uh, sorry, increasing pressure for disclosure, disclosure and action. And we can see that coming to life. Um, Tamara spoke about it, but we can also see that coming to life in Europe um, in the event of the Women on Boards Directive uh, of the European Parliament. Those kinds of things will lay the path for others to follow. And WEPS is an effective method to use as a catalyst for change, as a basis of measurement and a place to get started. And in closing, I would just like to encourage anyone in the audience looking at this journey, just take the first step. Make sure that in future, your organization isn't looking backwards, wishing that they had started just a little sooner. Thank you very, very much. And I hand back to Zhang. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Candice. I think you really uh, uh, finished your presentation with a very inspiring um, uh, remarks, and we very much appreciate it. 저희 시간이 많이 지났지만 저희 질의 응답 시간을 그래도 안 가질 수는 없지 않습니까? 여러분 그동안 오래 함께해 주셔서 감사한데요. 딱 5분만이라도 같이 질의 응답 잠깐 하겠습니다. 슬라이드로 주신 질문들 제가 조금 그룹핑을 해봐서 두 가지로 줄였습니다. 이두 가지에 대한 질문을 어, 여기 패널리스트에게 여러, 여, 여쭤보고요. 그분들의 답변을 쫘르륵 듣고 저희가 잠깐 후회하고 마치도록 하겠습니다. So, um, 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 panelists, we have uh, two questions that were were asked by the audience. I sort of grouped uh, similar questions. So I'm going to ask you two questions and please kindly take turns one by one and answer you uh, those questions with, uh, with your insights as concise as possible. So the first question is, um, when women, um, women colleagues in the current workplaces are content with the inequality and not actively aware or looking for empowerment, how do you inspire them? Um, 이 질문이 참 재밌는데요. 어, 사내에서 여성 직원들이 지금 이, 현실에, 현실에 존재하고 있는 불평등에 대해서 뭐 괜찮아 라는 그냥 그런 태도로 있고 여성의 엠파워먼트라든지 뭔가 이런, 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 이런 제도적인 변화를 갈구하지 않고 있을 때 이분들을 어떻게 어, 유도할 수 있고 영감을 이끌어낼 수 있냐 하는 그런 질문이 있었습니다. The second question is, how do you concretely help um, promote uh, 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 
facilitate promotion of women so that more women can really become the board members and member of the senior management. Um, if you can just provide very powerful and very uh, uh, concrete examples, that would be very helpful. 여성들의 승진과 또 이사진 또는 경영직 합류에 대해서 어떻게 어, 정말 효과적으로 기회를 제공할 수 있는지 어, 예시를 들어주시면 감사하겠습니다. 이렇게 질문이 들어왔습니다. So I will hand it over to you, panelists. I will just start with the reverse order, perhaps. So I will start with Candice and we'll end with Miwa. Is that okay? So please kindly provide your answers to the two questions. Over to you. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate being asked both questions at the same time because I, I think my answers to both of those questions are, are fairly similar. Um, in terms of, of how to inspire people who are content and not necessarily looking for upliftment and, and empowerment, I think was the word used, um, access to opportunity is really, really critical because providing people with the opportunity to see what alternatives are out there gives them the opportunity to chart a path for themselves as to what they want to be in future, what they want to see and how their personal development um, lays out. If somebody um, is, if we then use that same um, answer and think about it through the lens of the second question as to how to promote people um, into certain positions. Again, that opportunity for different aspects, for different um, areas of business to get involved in project work, to um, be excited about what is going on around them, the same things can be used. So training and development, um, opportunity to be engaged in various project work, um, and even things like stay interviews, where you make sure that you are listening and hearing your employees as to what they want from their personal development um, and where they see their careers going as well, can be a really powerful tool in terms of um, addressing both of those questions, in fact. I, I won't take up too much time because I know we're running short, but um, I'm happy to contribute more if it's necessary. Otherwise, I'll hand over. Can I? So maybe uh, I can share uh, the, the experience from Nestle, what we have done, and we, we call it Gender Balance Acceleration Program. It has three components for us. The, the bold leadership, you have to set the tone from the top, but uh, making sure that it doesn't stop there. You really need to cascade the, uh, these uh, mindsets to the whole organization because the change may not come only from the top. It's also each and every individual in the company needs to understand what's their impact area so that they can contribute the journey. So you need to be very uh, simple, straightforward, not big and vague I mean, statements, but more to explain how they can contribute the journey. And secondly, it's about empowering the, uh, the culture. So the policies, guidelines, practices need to walk to talk, meaning that when you would like to I mean, uh, increase the inclusion in your company, you need to make sure that you have inclusive policies in place. Like we uh, mentioned about the global parental support policy. It's, it's inclusive. It needs to be inclusive so that you, you reach out to everyone in the organization, not one part of it. And the flexible policies that you put in place. All the policy against violence, harassment and discrimination. You need to have a, a put in place a zero tolerance so that you, when, whenever people feel that they're discriminated or it's against the, I mean, the, the values that you spend for, they can speak up. So you need to uh, provide that platform so that they can speak up when it's not there. And the other part is, I think, enabling the practices, meaning that how do we make sure that all the talent discussion, all the succession planning uh, conversation or even performance calibration is removed from the bias? It's, I mean, sometimes we, 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 we need to make sure that these, uh, let's say, checklists need to be there and important people decisions need to be also uh, made uh, throughout these, let's say, um, biasless lenses so that we will uh, provide the equal opportunity to, uh, to everyone. So th these are the couple of things that I can share from my experience at Nestle. Thanks. I think I'm next, if I recall the order correctly. Um, 
So uh, the first question about for what about if women are content? So for, for us at MasterCard, it's being it's creating um, the inclusive environment so that everybody who comes to work feels that they have equal opportunity to the person down the hall or the person in the next office. And so for us, if we um, all of our initiatives, processes, practices and policies are all around that equity and that inclusion. So people have choice. And so if a, a female or a male chooses to be content where they are and may not seek higher promotions and climbing the ladder, that is perfectly fine. But what we in, want to ensure is that we at least give everybody the, the equal opportunity to make those decisions and make those choices that are best for themselves personally uh, and professionally. Um, with regards to the second question around the support, um, for us, male allyship is incredibly important because the reality of, of most organizations today is that a lot of the decision makers when it comes to hiring, promoting, um, are, are males. And so for us, uh, very, leaning in very heavily into the male allyship and having males included as part of all of our conversations so that we are gender neutral is very important and very powerful. And um, so for us, the engagement, not just to women, um, but to men. So I would, uh, recommend leaning heavily into a, a male allyship campaign if you are not already doing that. We found it to be uh, very effective. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, uh, well, I'll be very brief. So how do we inspire women? Education, 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 right? Um, so we need to ensure um, that as a company, you're constantly informing uh, your, uh, or, you know, uh, female employees of the opportunities. You're also presenting them with role models, right? Um, so hopefully you have at least one uh, female role model in your company of a senior level who can, uh, of course, speak uh, or, or, or about these issues, but uh, also, of course, uh, engage the, the, the men, right? The, the senior leadership. Um, if not, invite external speakers, right? But it's really important that you're constantly, uh, you know, uh, informing uh, uh, and inspiring them, of course, by both presenting the opportunities on the table, but also, as I said, uh, presenting them with uh, role models. And I also briefly spoke about this idea of nominating um, champions. Nominate a champion that can actually, uh, you know, uh, have uh, uh, informal conversations and encourage uh, fellow colleagues, right? Um, often that's the best way, at least uh, uh, that has also been my personal experience. Um, and then to the second question, you know, how do we promote more women um, in senior uh, leadership positions? I mean, um, previously we spoke a lot about this idea of sponsorship. That's certainly, uh, I think, an excellent way to do it. Um, uh, you know, there, there are divisive opinions around quotas, but let's be honest here, unless you establish a target, unless you establish a quota, you know, you're not going to uh, uh, go nowhere because it signals a willingness to do that. It signals commitment. But then loosen up the criteria, right? Don't be so restrictive. Um, you know, we, uh, earlier, Mihua, you referenced the issue, right, with uh, um, the aviation industry in this regard, lack of pilots. Um, we hear this all the time. Well, we don't have women to nominate on the board. Well, nominate uh, a senior woman. She doesn't have to be a vice president to serve on the board, right? I mean, lower the criteria and and start there because it's more important um, to include uh, uh, them around the table than not. But with that, uh, we need to be mindful that we can't just be including women as tokens. Uh, and we see that way too often. Make sure that when you include them on boards, on um, senior uh, governance bodies, they, they're actually able to uh, take an equal part in the decision making and have a voice. Thank you. 네, 저는 제 답변을 한국말로 할까요? 그러면 네, 그래 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 네, 정말 감사드리고요. 일단 연사분들께서 어떻게 하는지 방법론에 대해 잘 말씀을 해주신 것 같아요. 저는 그 조금 더 원론적인 이야기를 드려볼게요. 첫 번째 질문 이제 여성들이 참여를 안 한다. 이거는 모든 사회적 변화를 가져올 때 변화를 두려워하는 분들이 계시긴 계시잖아요. 예를 들어서 여성의 참정권 이슈가 지금은 당연히 여성들이 그 보트를 할 수가 있고 한데 지금 이제 와서 여성들은 어 어떤 여성이 아니 나는 이뭐 나는 투표권을 기법하겠다 이렇게 하는데 찬성을 하신 여성분이 계시는가요? 또 1970년대까지만 해도 스위스에서는 은행 계좌를 열때 남편의 동의가 있어야 했어요. 모든 여성들은. 현재 지금 은행 계좌를 열때 남편의 동의가 있어야 한다. 여기 찬성하신 여성분 아무도 없으시잖아요. 이런 것과 같이 처음에 변화는 어려울 수 있습니다. 하지만 
타마라가 말씀하신 것 같이 계속 교육, 교육 또 다른 분들이 말씀하신 것 같이 인식의 변화를 통해서 이 변화를 조금 더 익숙하게 만들어 주시면 이분들의 참여도 좀 끌어올리실 수 있을 것 같습니다. 그리고 두 번째 이제 경영진을 어떻게 여성 경영진을 어떻게 느리냐에 대해서 질문해 주셨는데요. 저는 어 일단은 뭐 밖에 스카우트 하시지 말고 안에서 올리는 방법을 추천드리고 싶고 저는 일단 느리는 것도 중요하지만 이런 여성 임원진들이 어 실제로 얼마나 의사결정에 얼마나 힘을 실을 수 있는지 그걸 보시고 이 포지션의 여성들을 올리는 것이 중요하다고 생각을 해요. 보시면 은 기업의 임원진들을 쭉 보시면 여성들이 하는 특정 기업의 임원 포지션이 있어요. 제가 뭐라고 말씀을 드리지 않겠지만 그런데 그분들이 실질적으로 기업의 의사결정에 얼마만큼의 영향을 미칠 수 있냐를 보면 은 남성들이 위주인 그런 포지션들에 비해서 이 힘이 약합니다. 그래서 이런 좀더 여성들이 조금 더 힘을 낼수 있는 그런 기업의 임원이 될수 있도록 조금 더 전략적으로 여성들을 좀, 어, 좀 진출을 시키시는 게 중요할 것 같습니다. 네. 아 정말 감사합니다. 어 아주 짧은 시간이었지만 질의응답을 통해서 어, 아주 핵심적인 좀 근론 근본적인 그런 문제들을 집어주신 것 같아서 정말 감사드립니다. 자 여기 오늘 다, 어, 다섯 분의 연사님들께 다시 한번 뜨거운 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure and honor for us, and it's been so informative. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we really wish you uh, best, and we hope that we can see you sometime in person. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you, bye -bye. you for having us. Bye-bye.